You are listening to Radiant Creators, a collaborative project composed of people whose passion, purpose, and dedication requires forging their own unique path of empowerment and livelihood. A Radiant Creator isn't making a living, they are living. Rest into an hour and see what we can do. And so today on Radiant Creators, we're talking to Tristan Haggard of Primal Edge Health. And Craig, what's yes. up, man? Nice to be here. Oh, it's it's great to have you here in virtual land. So, okay. here's the thought: you're doing something very, very unique. And how do we get into it? Because I really would like to maybe in the course of an hour get people, uh, allow them to have an idea of what you're about and what yeah. you know living naturally is about. I I like thinking of it as getting back to our ice age hunter roots. <laughs> a much a much stronger time for humanity before it was um, put into human feedlots, also known as cities. So right. yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's exactly how I see it, man. It's you know we've kind of live we live in this socially engineered kind of uh, people call it the rat race, and it kind of literally is that. I mean, we basically get treated like like mice in a maze. We get fed chow, um, and it's a pretty inhumane way to live in my opinion, um, in this kind of, you know, big city rat race life. So, you know, our, uh, our mission in, in kind of formatting our, uh, our lifestyle here was to get back to a place where we were connected with our source of food, get, uh, get somewhere where we could actually be, um, you know, in a somewhat rural area. Um, so we, yeah, we, in 2010, my wife and I moved out into the middle of nowhere in Ecuador and, uh, I guess these, Oh, excuse me. So in 2010, my wife Jessica and I, we left the U.S., came down here to Ecuador, and um, we've been here since then. So it's been about nine years living up in the middle of nowhere in a small town in the Andes of Ecuador. And um, we run a website. We talk a lot about health, nutrition, um, you know, kind of getting back to a diet that is appropriate for human beings, a diet that, um, you know, considers nutrient density, um, nutrient bioavailability, satiety, and we definitely like to focus on the most uh, easily digestible and assimilable foods that re- that have all the nutrients we require in their most bioavailable form, and that's going to be animal foods. So we've uh, kind of gradually uh, taken this path towards trying to refine our diet, refine our lifestyle, and uh, uh, you know manage certain health issues that we've dealt with, and uh, you know just improve our well-being in general. Using diet, using lifestyle, and we run a website called Primal Edge Health. Got a YouTube channel as well, and we talk all about all this stuff. Talk about the uh, the social engineering aspects of food. We talk about uh, methods and ways that we can get in touch with um, with our food supply. You know, I mean, uh, we're always promoting local farms. Uh, you know, uh, sourcing your uh, meats directly from ranchers, which is uh, you know, yesterday I did a stream with a guy called Bart Simmons out of Texas, him and his son, Andrew Simmons. And we talked all about what it's like being ranchers, uh, grass-fed, grass-finished cattle ranchers. So uh, we're all about promoting true sustainability, uh, not in the sustainable development, social engineering way, but in how to sustain our lives, sustain our families, sustain our cultures, and regenerate our bodies while regenerating our cultures and using uh, regenerative agriculture, which always includes animal input, um, and our diet right now focuses a lot on ruminant animals, animal fat and protein. And, uh, so a lot of people have come upon this as a method of losing weight, of maintaining good, healthy body composition, of getting better mental clarity, stuff like that. But it kind of goes beyond that to, um, to some of the deeper aspects that are, uh, that are driving and weaving the very fabric of our reality in this kind of increasing the increasingly globalized technocratic society that we live in um and we definitely see food as food culture as a major social engineering front i mean you got you know monsanto taking over most of the food supply telling us to eat corn and wheat and soy and all this junk food crap that we don't need um basically eating starvation food most of the population being fed on kibble myself you know being raised on uh, cheery, uh, you know, cereal, honey nut Cheerios and, uh, lucky charms and all this junk food. Um, and we're all about taking back our cultures, taking back our health and really using diet and lifestyle as 
a way to um, to kind of fight the degeneracy that we see around us. Yeah, because when it comes to farming, even organic monocrops are fairly difficult for the environment, you know, and so the idea that the grazing ungulate is not good and farming, you know, monocrops is good is always very puzzling. I think a lot of people just don't have the experience of ever growing a garden or especially being a farmer. I was an organic farmer for a while and I can say that, oh, we did a couple acres and it was organic, but I could see it. It was very enlightening that, you know, this is actually... Uh, the environment doesn't like it. Nature's trying to kill this because it doesn't belong there. So when you're farming, there's this constant battle between nature going, that doesn't belong there, I have to kill it, and and you. So it's, it's funny, our food supply itself, if you look at a vegetarian-based diet, is a battle with nature itself. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm curious, so you did organic farm for, uh, you said two, it was two acres. Were you able to uh, eat completely off of your own land with that? That's the thing. I would say no. Because now you can, I think it was about f between five and seven acres that were actually planted. And so as an organic farmer, people don't always quite get the big picture. They think, well, I could just farm and live. And like, well, you know, seed is phenomenally expensive. Do you have any idea what it takes to even weed a quarter acre? and such like that yeah. and then of course you need lots of water you got to irrigate that from somewhere because it never really it doesn't rain many places enough so you're kind of yeah. setting up this unnatural environment to grow plants that nature wants to kill and if you had an acre of land i would say you would do far greater having a couple goats and a bunch of chickens than yeah. growing anything i mean oh sure you know gr grow some stuff that that's fine but I would say that from my meager experience monocropping, even organically, it's hard to get enough calories per acre to really live on. It, right, you and, we, and you can't get enough. I mean, you're talking about we need proteins and fats. There's essential amino acids, essential fatty acids. Um, the most bioavailable forms of this without the, nece the, ne the necessary processing um, and the heavy labor-intensive um, methods of extraction – are going to be animal foods. So, I mean, having some chickens, you can have backyard chickens and give yourself quite a few eggs if you've, you know, you've got enough compost, if you've got enough food input for the chickens. Now, even having, you know, a few goats on a piece of land, like I've got a, a, some friends or how, how much land did Dawid and Adrian on? Like two hectares, right? Yeah, it's, not it's less than five acres. And how many goats do they have? They have 24. 24 goats. And and could have more on the you know pretty small piece of land. They uh, they use kind of some rotational grazing stuff, and but they basically feed themselves off their own land. Um, now they trade for a lot of other foods. They're not just eating uh, you know, nothing but goat meat. They like to sell. They sell milk. Um, they sell goat meat, and uh, they trade for other stuff. But they are able to live and sustain themselves off a small piece of land using animal agriculture. Now that same piece of land, it'd be literally impossible for them to even feed one person. Um, off of plant agriculture, right? So animal husbandry is really important as far as uh, being food independent and, uh, you know, for ideas like food sovereignty. And I think that's why we see a major social engineering push to bring about the popularity of vegetarian and vegan diets. We see, um, you know, animal rights activism being pushed by a lot of these globalist characters like Peter Singer, um, uh, even Richard Dawkins, has made comments about you know um, a vegetarian and veganism being a good idea, while at the same time advocating for cannibalism, and uh, for reducing or uh, getting rid of the taboo of cannibalism. He made a tweet um, about that. So it, we see a big social engineering push for these plant foods and telling us that animal foods are bad, that it's bad for the environment, that cow farts are destroying the planet, all this nonsense. And uh, I mean, to me, it just seems like a, a very effective way to get people off the land, to get people dependent on processed foods. And, um, you know, the industrial agriculture system has already, for the most part, destroyed the small family farm, destroyed people's ability to actually feed themselves. And, um, and they're going after the cattle ranchers now. So you look at the, uh, you know, meat production in the U.S. and the processing of meat – uh, you know, uh, slaughter and, you know, actually, you know, uh, the, the processing of the meat, it's done by 
four major corporations, you know, including Cargill, Tyson Foods. Uh, you look at the grain supply that's been fed in these feedlots to fatten up the cows really rapidly. It's all consolidated um, in the hands of a few companies like Dow, Archer Daniels, Midlands, Cargill, um, Monsanto. They're using patented seeds, GMO seeds that are highly destructive to the environment. They're monocropping the shit out of the, co- uh, out of the soil. And it really is absolutely destructive, the uh, practices that they're using. But then they blame the cows, right? They're blaming the cows for this brand new factory farming system that just got brought about that's absolutely new. You know, this came about in the 70s and 80s um, when corn started getting heavily subsidized. And um, yet they, they blame they blame the little guy. They say that, oh, these cows are destroying the environment. They're farting. They're creating global warming, which, you know, anybody who can um, – you know, think for themselves, can look into these uh, the claims being made by some of these alarmists concerning climate change and global warming. And um, Previously, it was an ice age is coming, then it was global warming. Now it's just climate change. And if the climate does change, which it's never supposed to do, it's because you naughty people are eating meat and having babies, and uh, and it's all your fault. You know, there's no talk of the industrial agriculture system, these uh, these major corporations that are consolidating the food supply, destroying our heritage foods. And um, and this is all by design. This is a social engineering method for actually consolidating power, resources and land and making people dependent. No, it absolutely is. And, you know, when it comes to global warming and the cows, these great excuses they have, which are really just – outright programming of people. There's some books I've been reading recently. One is called The Fate of Rome, Climate Disease, and the End of Empire. And then another one is, um, yeah, Ancient Empires. And it's like, it's called Life, Death, Rhythms. Life, Death, Rhythms of Ancient Empires, Climatic Cycles Influencing Rule of Dynasties. And if we just look back a little ways, start a couple hundred years, a thousand years, you can look and you can see that climate it, it does change radically over time, and it's natural. And it's, it's one of the things that bugs me is I wish people – and this is part of why I like what you're doing, uh, Primal Edge Health, is that I think as you get healthier, when you start eating a proper diet, when you start exercising as you should, when you start living a more natural life, then you start to turn on your natural human instincts again, which we do have. Then you start looking at global warming and you go, well, that's just bullshit. And the idea of cows farting and that's destroying the earth, like you go, well, that's that's nonsense. And you can look at a farm and you can go, well, you know, I would eventually get scurvy and die if I could only eat what was growing out of the ground. I mean, you look at how much trouble it is to grow a crop. I mean, yeah, we should. It's fun. But at the same time... if it was survival, if you had this much land, like your tribe owned this much land and you have this much, what are you going to do to survive? You'd be like, get me some goats, get me some chickens, I need some rabbits, I need to go out and hunt, and you're going to... We live in a way that just kind of wastes our time. So when I look well, around right now... It's even unethical, go, right? It's, uh, it's slavery to hold these animals. It's, uh, you know, they, they say meat is murder. Right. I mean, that's uh, the animal activism thing is just getting so ridiculous and out of control. Um, you know, these same people, they they claim meat is murder. Um, yet abortion is a woman's right. Right. It's a nine, nine month abortions are are something that are great. It's enlightening. But meat is murder and chicken eggs are rape. It's just um, the, 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 the social engineering aspect of it is really uh, it's really potent these days, especially in the, uh, you know, the animal rights activism movement. And it's uh, really disconnecting. And that's why we definitely need to get back to our primal edge because something that was very striking to us recently was we went to a renaissance fair. And I don't know what it is about people who like the renaissance fairs, but it seems to attract the, the, the most extremely unhealthy people on the planet. And as we were there, you know, bless your renaissance people, it, it's great. But as we wandered around, it was this new experience we, we haven't quite had before in realizing how sick humanity is. I mean, how many people can hardly waddle and just how pale and Isn't it like 60% Ill. of Americans are obese now? I yeah. think uh, it might even be climbing. I'm sure it's climbing. But yeah, it's crazy. And we they, they, they blame it on uh, meat and uh, saturated fat. When the saturated fat intake has actually declined, we've been eating all these processed uh, refined vegetable oils and uh, lots of processed grains. And when you do feed a lot of people a lot of grain, um, 
especially now, uh, you see a lot of gut issues. You know, we've got a lot of pesticides being used. The uh, the pesticides will disrupt the gut microbiome and actually destroy the lining of the gut and make it more likely for us to get particulates through the gut barrier uh, because these little things called microvilli, they're like little fingers lining our gut, which our gut has more nerves than almost any other um, you know, external part of the body. They're more nerves, more sensitive on the gut than in the gut than it is in the tips of our fingers. And these little microvilli get separated when they're exposed to compounds like zonulin and wheat and it actually opens up the blood-brain barrier and allows toxins to get into the brain. So then we've got this axis of you know the gut affecting the brain negatively, uh, creating more hunger, making us uh, inflamed and uh, driving blood glucose dysregulation and it just becomes a, a huge mess. Yeah, and it seems like people – aren't foraging anymore. I know it's something that we struggle to do because we're living in Arizona. But when I first got here, I thought, oh my God, I live on Mars. It's, it's nothing but death out there. But yeah. when you begin to learn about your native environment, you realize, oh, out here in the desert, it rains food on you. You can eat about everything out there. And that includes the rabbits that are running around and the lizards and things like that. So you go from Mars... deer out there too, right? What's, what's that? Deer. Are oh, there's coos deer. deer. Oh, there's coos deer. There's elk. There's bears. There's everything. So, down here in the high desert, it's you know pretty much rabbits and gila monsters, and uh, your occasional coos deer, and you have a lot of wild horses. You have all kinds of stuff. But when you go yeah. up northern Arizona, you get more into the the mule deer and elk and larger animals like that. So it changes things. And you can fish down here too. We have the rivers that flow through. So you find that. The desert, which seems so barren, is actually full of food. So something I ponder oftentimes is, what is a natural human diet? And it seems like, go forage in your area. It's so uh, empowering to your instincts, to your body, to your health, to your mind on every level. And also, it creates a certain confidence when you know that, hey, I could survive right here. Here it all is. Like mesquite, it just rains mesquite here. And you can, it's a little carby. I'm not so sure how healthy it is to as a staple, but the natives ate it. I mean, who were here yeah, before us. Yeah, they used to us. make cakes out of it, yeah. And it's good. It's very good. So Yeah, it's super sweet. Yeah, it, it's got a good carb content. I guess people who are more health conscious, they like, they, they don't eat the, the, the pod, just the seeds and such like that. There's like, you know. Uh, you got to be careful too with a lot of these, the thing with a lot of these seeds and these nut-based plants is they, uh, they actually do have an anti-nutrient aspect to them, which is you know, prob probably part of why most people s tend to self-select if they um, have a lot of animal foods available in their environment or if they don't. They still always tend to prefer to go towards animal foods. Is the digestibility is just so much better. Um, they're so much easier. Uh, they're so much easier to break down because in a lot of seeds and nuts, you see what are called phytates, and uh, these are anti nutrients that actually will bind up to minerals like calcium, manganese, phosphorus, magnesium, uh, and they will decrease the bioavailability of minerals in the body. So you look at um, you know, high consumption of something like oxalates and oxalates are you know, oxalic acid and oxalic acid when it combines with calcium or with other metals uh, in the body or with other compounds and minerals it becomes it can create oxalate crystals so when it combines with calcium it can create calcium oxalate crystals and this can cause kidney stones a lot of people who have uh, had kidney stones in the past I wouldn't wish it on anybody it seems like it's something that's horrifically painful um, and uh, yeah, these are uh, many times caused by the accumulation of oxalates in the body. So it's very um, high content of oxalates in grains, in nuts. Uh, spinach is one of the highest oxalate foods out there. And I mean, a lot of these foods that we love so much, unfortunately, from the plant kingdom, unfortunately, a lot of them do have certain nutritive properties, um, or at, rather anti-nutritive properties, like phytates, lectins, um, saponins, um, and... A lot of these uh, plant compounds can actually do a lot of damage in the human body, and they're actually natural pesticides that these uh, plants create that um, that will elicit an immune response in people too. Now, some of these are considered antioxidants. You're, uh, some of them are like uh, they they talk about um, polyphenols, but. Uh, and I talk about polyphenols being super beneficial and that these bright colored fruits and vegetables are so beneficial because they have these polyphenols. But the benefits of polyphenols, if anything, would just be hormetic. 
just like with uh, there's a woman named uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, and she's a very intelligent woman, but I definitely disagree with her on the uh, massive consumption of broccoli sprouts because she talks about something called um, um, sulforaphane. And sulforaphane, when you consume a bunch of broccoli sprouts, this compound called sulforaphane has been associated with certain results in laboratory settings. But when you actually look at what it does in the body, it's uh, creating a natural antioxidant response in your body. It makes your body produce more glutathione to deal with the toxic load of these plant compounds. So a lot of these plants that we think are so good, a lot of these um, you know, polyphenols that we think are so amazing – when you look at what's actually going on in the body, your body is responding to the negative aspects of these plants. So some people would say, oh, that's good. It's a hormetic stressor, just like you know, a little bit of cold exposure will improve your health, just like you, know, you get in a sauna, you sweat, and it's a good thing. But um, I think we do need to look a little bit closer at some of these compounds and the overconsumption of them possibly leading to uh, neg negative health outcomes. We know that oxalates, very high in spinach, a lot of people, people have died from uh, this, there's actually a case study of a uh, type 2 diabetic who died from eating a sorrel soup. And sorrel is this uh, green that a lot of people sell at farmer's markets. It's one of the highest oxalate foods out there. And you can get acute oxalate poisoning and actually die. Now, when people drink antifreeze, they die not because antifreeze is toxin but because it becomes oxalate in the body. So you die of oxalate toxicity when you drink antifreeze. Then there's other plants that we've got like here in Ecuador – um, there's a sap of this tree that everybody plants around. And if you get that white sap, this little white goo in your body, just a few drops of it can send you to the hospital um, and a significant dose of it can kill somebody. So um, not to say that all plants are bad, but it is something that we need to consider uh, when looking at prioritization of where we're getting our calories from. Uh, there are no anti-nutrients in meats. There are no anti-nutrients in animal fats and proteins. And they are e the most easily digestible and assimilable food. They don't have the unnecessary fiber. A lot of people think that fiber is so good and so necessary. Um, but when you actually look at the studies on you know, fiber association with constipation and uh, you know, controlled studies where they actually removed fiber from, pa from patients with constipation, you see massive improvements of their symptoms. Of 100, uh, there was a study with 63 patients with – constipation. They weeded out the people who had, um, you know, inherent issues with blockages because of, you know, physical blockages in their gut. And they found that removal of fiber totally removed, uh, from the diet fiber. And they found that it actually resolved all their symptoms of constipation in the group where it was removed In the group that was just low fiber, like 33% of them still had constipation In the group that was high fiber, a hundred percent of them had constipation and symptoms of constipation. So, um, Plants can be great survival foods, uh, but I think – I don't know. I'm starting to look at them more as just that, you know, foods that you eat if you need to, whereas uh, meats, fat from animals seems to be the most bioavailable and easily digestible food uh, that we can go for. And I think that's why every culture self-selects to eat a majority of their calories from animal foods. Even when they've got abundant tropical fruits available, um, you know, the Polynesian islands and Bali, a lot of these uh, – all these islanders throughout the South Pacific, they still ate mostly animal foods with some fruits and vegetables. And the people that lived internally in the island – would trade some of their goods for fish and seafood from the coast. So it's not uh, – it's, it's very important to look at the, uh, the, ne the necessary nature of animal foods in the diet. The only way to live without animal foods is with heavy supplementation, with a very carefully regimented diet that – I mean 84% of vegans and vegetarians end up leaving vegan, veganism and vegetarianism for a reason. And that's because it's not easy to digest these foods. It's not easy to go without meat and our bodies – uh, require animal foods um, to survive and to thrive. Yeah, and the vegan thing and the vegetarian thing seems to be something that many, many people go through along their path. And it's all about are you, do you want to get stuck in a cult or are you actually truth seeking? Do you want to know what the optimal human diet is? Because the optimal human diet for the body is also the optimal human diet for the planet. I've always thought, and that's what led me to be more primal in my, primal in my diet, because I did the vegan thing, I did the raw food thing, and, you know, here's the thing, if it worked, I'd love it, great, it'd be great, I'd, I'd love it, it'd be neat, uh, but it doesn't, and, that, and that's the thing, is something that a lot of people who are 
especially YouTube personalities that are, are pushing veganism and vegetarianism, I think they've long since started cheating, but they're still pushing it because they have a cult following. And so unfortunately, veganism is not based in truth, and it, it, it's a cult. It's a very, very unfortunate cult that we have. I, that's what I call it, at least. It's a cult because it fails everybody, and then they just try harder. Oh, I must need to cleanse, or I'm not getting enough goji berries, or, <laughs> or whatever. And so eating primal... What does that look like? Because you're talking about something which is extremely 100% opposite of what most people think is is uh, an optimum diet. Because fiber, for one thing, we're told it's so important. And it, it does upset the gut. And then I can definitely speak to oxalates. Um, you know, oxalates almost wiped me out. I had kidney stones and, you know, gut So pains. prevalent in being yeah. a vegetarian. And so the green smoothies, the green juices, the greens, the leafy greens. Yeah, and kidney stones nuts, suck. The seeds, all and, these things. Yeah, a lot of people will say that they, well, they say they know that they're healthy or they think they are, but have they ever had their gut biome tested? I mean, it gets a little pricey where you, you know, you're doing like you're sending off your poop and your spit and your urine, but if you get your gut biome tested, like I had mine, and then they're like, oh yeah, your oxalates are off the charts. You know, mm. and they can tell you like you shouldn't eat it at all, ever. You know, everyone has different, and so yeah. I'm, I'm kind I mean, of a, what is a low oxalate diet that's based around plants? I mean, yeah, it's almost impossible to do, especially when the best is zero oxalates, because you very well might be eating an, just an outright poison. There might not be a good side to it at all. You know, it's hard for me to justify eating oxalates at all at this point. After all the people I've talked to who've had kidney stone issues, after coming from vegan vegetarian diets, um, and you know, just so many. So many people suffering from uh, these ailments, joint pain, arthritic symptoms, and then the removal of oxalates resolves it all uh, very quickly. And then as soon as they eat some of these oxalates again, the, uh, the symptoms come back. It's, it's something that is just so obvious to me that maybe uh, we need to reconsider the, uh, the necessary nature of plants. So uh, essentially uh, what we recommend is basing the majority of the diet around animal foods. And that doesn't mean you have to do a 100% carnivorous diet. It doesn't mean you need to remove animal foods altogether. It doesn't even mean you need to eat a low-carb diet. Um, what I'm saying, though, is that animal foods should make up a bulk of your calories. Um, protein doesn't come from powders. Protein doesn't come from nuts and plants and seeds. Um, bioavailable digestible proteins and fats come from animal foods. All else is extra, right? You can survive off of only meat. I'm not saying everybody should. My diet basically right now looks like meat and dairy foods, um, just all animal foods. Uh, every once in a while, I have some honey. Uh, if I'm going to try to gain weight and add some carbohydrates, maybe use a little bit of honey, maybe use some raw whole milk for carbs. But um, over the last couple of years, my diet has basically transitioned into an all animal food diet. Now, um, there is there's no reason for everybody to remove all plants from their diet, but people should be mindful of things like oxalates. Uh, spinach is probably not the greatest health food in the world. Almond flour is probably not the best uh, food to be eating regularly. Yes, some of these things taste great and uh, they can be delicious, but these foods um, that are so high in oxalates, so high in these plant toxins, uh, should be consumed with caution. So yeah, basically uh, ruminant animals give us all the nutrition we need. I mean, we can get all the uh, the necessary fats and proteins from animal fat and protein. And there are people who've lived long, healthy, happy lives eating just animal foods. You know, the Inuit populations being one example of this, living off of um, uh, living off of caribou, living off of seals, eating a high fat diet based around animal foods. Some of them, including some plant foods, seasonally maybe a little bit of. Um, uh, berries here and there, but most of these Inuit populations living off of exclusively animal foods. Their um, Weston A. Price's book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, it is a pretty important piece of work uh, concerning anthropology, history, uh, and diet. He was a dentist who actually traveled around um, the world trying to figure out why the Western populations were suffering from things like dental caries, uh, the narrowing of the hip girdle in women, making childbearing much more difficult. Uh, the narrowing of the jaw, 
the narrowing of the face in many populations in the West. And he noticed when he was traveling around that these populations that were eating a diet that was not of imported foods, that was not based on grain, you notice that all of these native populations from the Hebrides Islands in um, in Scotland to the Lochental Valley in Switzerland um, to you know, the Americas, to the uh, the Andean populations, to the um, – I mean, just he went everywhere. The, the Seminole Indians in the United States, near Florida, all of these people were living off of primarily animal foods, many of them using some plant foods, but all the plant foods we had, uh, they all had specific, almost ritualistic methods of preparation of these plants to render them digestible and safe to eat. And they would all self select to eat mostly animal foods, some of them exclusively animal foods. You know, the, uh, the Scottish population in the Hebrides Islands eating mostly fish and seafood with some oats that they would grow, a uh, limited amount of oats, but eating a lot of like, you know, they would stuff the oats in cod's heads. They would eat a lot of cod liver. They would eat a lot of seafood, uh, you know, fish, shellfish. Um, and all of these populations ate a heavy animal food-based diet. And um, animal foods are the crux of the human diet. They're necessary for human health. You cannot live on just plants alone long term other than, you know, short term fasting, which can be beneficial. But long term, you cannot live on plants alone uh, without the help of um, synthetic supplements. And if not done correctly, it uh, can really wreck people's health. And I would posit that even if it is done correctly, with in quotations, like the uh, you know, vegans and vegetarians like to say, um, not vegetarians, but vegans like to say, uh, because vegetarians still include dairy foods. So if you you know include eggs and milk in your diet, uh, you, you could definitely make a case that maybe you don't need meat and animal foods as much. But um, yeah, the vegan diet in particular is impossible for humans to sustain life with without supplementation and uh but you can live exclusively off of animal foods with no plants at all and many people do it uh, including myself i'm not saying everybody should but what i am saying is that we need to include animal foods in the diet and they should make up a bulk of the caloric intake um in our daily diet especially now that so many of these plant foods are processed in a way that makes them um you know, almost weaponized, right? The white sugar, the uh, processed refined starches, like all this, you know, potato chips and, um, you know, grain-based kibble that we get fed, this prepackaged slop is um, is detrimental to our health and creating the, uh, the health issues we see today. You know, these refined oils that are so full of polyunsaturated fats, the omega-6s uh, that are in these vegetable oils, those actually create insulin resistance and inflammatory responses systemically in the body. They destroy our digestion. Uh, but animal foods are easily digested and should always be included and prioritized in the, uh, in the human diet. Something people are doing these days that has really taken off is butter coffee, is caveman coffee. <clears throat> and now some people, they don't drink coffee. You can put it in tea. You can put it in herbal tea, whatever. But it is kind of an overnight sensation. And I think Dave Osbury of Bulletproof Exec, he probably was the one who brought that to, to light. It's probably always existed. But I think when he started talking about it, it really took off. What do you think of the traditional butter coffee? I mean, actually, that came from what the Himalayas, which was actually yak butter tea. Uh, but I found that's kind of what, when I got over being vegetarian, that was really like my first step was I, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to drink butter. But I put it in the coffee, put it in the blender. And I was, it was life changing. I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize I had felt like shit for years until I drank that. And then, you know, went and chased down an elk and strangled it with my bare hands. And I was just kidding. <laughs> I shot it. Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, the the butter coffee thing, it's an interesting bridge for a lot of people. You know, I mean, it shows people that fats um, are an efficient fuel. And you know, when we're fasting, uh, which fasting has been used in every uh, culture, every spiritual tradition for healing and for, uh, you know, kind of um, purification uh, spiritually in many regards. And 
when you're fasting, you're burning body fat. And that's pure fat. It's saturated fat. Your body stores more fat than it does carbohydrates. So fat is a very efficient energy source that we can all tap into if we give our body the ability to do that. So people, you know, they start skipping breakfast, have some butter coffee in the morning, and they realize that they feel better running off of fat. Um, I, I don't really, I don't drink coffee, but I, I totally understand it. I've had you know, butter coffee. And if I, if I'm going to drink coffee, it's going to be, you know, with a bunch of cream. I really like cream because it mixes in real well with the, uh, uh, like heavy raw cream. It mixes well with the, uh, the coffee, but I think it's a great gateway drug to, uh, to ketosis, which is the state in which your body is burning fat for fuel. And if people have body fat to burn, the body wants to burn that fat. Uh, actually we store a lot of stem cells in our body fat and we release, um, those stem cells when we're burning that body fat and that actually helps to regenerate our body. So we do have the ability to tap into that fat if we give our body the space through, like you mentioned, meal timing of like restricting the eating window and doing a little bit of like intermittent fasting or just simply, uh, giving your body fat as a fuel source and your body will, uh, eventually tell you, Hey, I've got plenty of this already on me. I'm ready to burn the body fat. So it, um, it's a, it's a powerful tool and it definitely shows people, um, the importance of fats and gets them to not be so afraid of them. Cause we've been told since the seventies that saturated fat is bad and that these refined vegetable oils and grains are heart healthy and that they're going to, you know, keep us from getting a heart attack. All the while our, our, uh, intake of saturated fat has decreased dramatically and heart disease has gone up. Diabetes has gone up. Cancer rates have gone up. So um, uh, obviously something in the standard American diet is not working. And um, uh, the meat, the saturated fat, has been blamed for what the bread and the, uh, and the refined oils are actually doing to us. Yeah, especially people need to just look around. And you got to be able to tell that something is not working. And it doesn't seem that people get it. They just try harder to eat unhealthy and see if it starts working. So that's what we're definitely trying to do here is, is get that across is that because I feel for people who are vastly unhealthy, oftentimes obese, and they're, they're just trying harder and harder to do something that will never work and be healthy. And that's, you know, nobody wants to see that. Well, there's a, you ever heard of Arthur Haynes? He's got his book, A New Path. Yeah. And and he's an interesting character, and he just part of his premise is we used to be healthier if if we look back at our hunter gatherer uh, ancestors, like you mentioned Weston Price and him looking at their teeth, and and there's pictures in that book, and you go like, wow, how come our more primal, more natural indigenous hunter gathering cultures, like the less that they've been exposed to any kind of refined food at all. Like, how come they have perfect teeth and we don't? How and they don't come? brush their teeth. They yeah. didn't brush them. They didn't have dental hygiene lessons from uh, the American Dental Association, fluoridated toothpaste. Yet they had perfect teeth, perfectly developed skulls, and um, you know were highly intelligent, highly connected to their environment. But then the first generation, what do you notice in this book? The first generation that gets on the imported grains, the sugar, and all this crap, and gives up their animal fats and proteins, that give up their animal foods, their heritage foods, they degenerate quickly uh, physically, and also societies degenerate as well. So the Swiss in the Lucentel Valley, they had no police. They had no doctors. They didn't need them. Right? These people had – there was no police station. There was, uh, there was no need for hospitals in this valley in Switzerland. Uh, but just a couple uh, mountains over where they had more contact with the modern foods, the tuberculosis rates were higher than uh, many other parts of the world. And they had terrible health issues. And then the first generation of the introduction of these foods um, he was seeing, and this was in the 1930s that he was traveling. This was before the further industrialization of our food supply. Uh, he was seeing massive degeneration within one generation. And then each subsequent generation getting worse and worse with, uh, uh, with the introduction of these. He would call them the foods of commerce. And uh, they're basically degenerative foods that are you know, highly profitable to sell. But they end up destroying people's health and destroying their cultures. Yeah, we need to realize that whenever we see braces, if if you've worn braces, when you see and you see other people wearing braces, that that's not natural. We naturally have beautiful straight teeth with a bit of space between all of them, and we wonder, you know, if anybody questions has a 
uh, the foods of commerce, have they damaged the human body? Well, yeah, because we used to have straight teeth, and now we don't. We're wearing braces because we're so warped by the, f- the foods of commerce. I think that's a great way of putting it. Mm. Yeah, Absolutely. If you, yeah, if you want proof, braces. There you go. Yeah, I highly suggest everybody check out that book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, just for uh, – I, th- I think it's one of the most important works of anthropology of the 20th century because this was right before World War II, before the massive push for the industrialization of the food supply. And he documented a very important time in our very recent history. And I like to point that one out because, I mean, we could go back to – we could speculate on uh, what people were doing a few thousand years ago. Uh, but I think it's even – better demonstrate uh, more than demonstrative to look at just a couple generations back um you know our, our great grandparents generation and the generation before them uh the practices in these societies pre-industrialization pre-western imported food and um and, and look at the health of these people and what they were eating within their environment without importing or exporting without this globalist trade system and uh it's it's pretty obvious that the animal foods were they were always fertility foods, you know. They uh, certain foods like uh, um, certain seafoods, very rich in iodine and vitamin A, were always used for fertility. They all, uh, most of these societies would eat uh, organs. They would eat like liver. Uh, they would eat uh, the entire animal, nose to tail. They'd eat the bone marrow, especially uh, like when you look at bone fragments from um, or you know camping sites from Native Americans, and uh, they they're always just shattered bones all over the place because. People go for the fat. They want the fatty parts of the animal and the bone marrow, um, the brain. I mean, these have loads of nutrients you're not going to find in other parts of the animal. The Native Americans in this culture, I'm sorry, in this country, one of the real treats when it came to the buffalo was they would grab the liver and they would squeeze the gallbladder onto it. Not sure why, but we know that they did, and that was it. And they'd usually eat it raw. That was the first thing, is they'd go after the, yeah. the organs and the brain. So it was, it was brain, liver, and gallbladder. Yeah, and marrow. And marrow. Yeah, and a lot of marrow there. The well, you fat, mentioned the fat, the fat around the kidneys as well, the suet. You can get mm-hmm. these things pretty cheap. Uh, yeah, I mean, people are demanding more of these cuts, and a lot of a lot of these. Uh, like I talked to a grass-fed cattle rancher yesterday. He's selling a lot more organ meats. People are interested in the suet. They want the unrendered fat, and uh, people are starting to catch on, and it's a uh, it's a good thing. I didn't know this until recently that hamburger, you know, ground meats used to also be ground meat with organs in it. That was way more common in in, yeah. in America, and I didn't know that. And now it's just meat, and that's all there is. And is that a good gateway, like along with, you know, butter coffee being a gateway to ketosis, to eating a high fat diet? Um, when we mention eating uh, organ meats, that kind of freaks a lot of people out because they're truly not used to it. And it's strange. Yeah, to eat a it's tongue, usually later on. Liver. Later on, they'll be ready for that. Yeah. Usually it's like, you know, get people to not be afraid of a steak. Yeah. <laughs> right? You know, have a, have a nice ribeye, have a nice fatty T-bone, porterhouse steak. Um, have that for dinner every night and see how much better you feel, right? Start replacing the wheat, the grains with meat, right? Re- replace the wheat with some meat. I mean, that's just a really simple thing that most people can do and see uh, results in their body composition and their general health. Yeah, and maybe a good, a good first step also is when you're eating your steak, eat the fat too. Because everybody, yes. they, they cut around it, they leave it like it's this... It's this dangerous and scary, indecent thing, and uh, it's so sad to see because when you see after people have eaten dinner, you you realize, wow, you threw away the best part. Like the meat really is that's nice, but you just oh, you know. So you just think I'll yeah. take it. <laughs> yeah, you start to look for the steaks with the most fat on them, and that's the uh, that's actually the best part of the uh, of the steak is all that good fat. You know, I mean, these animals are taking indigestible plant matter, grass. And they're converting it into digestible fats and proteins for us. And they do it without us having to till the soil, which destroys soil. Uh, they do this while they're regenerating soil and adding back um, you know, living bacteria, putting manure into the soil, putting nitrogen into the soil, putting um, actually sequestering the carbon into the soil. Everyone tells you carbon dioxide is this toxin, which is nonsense. But these uh, ruminant animals actually help to trap and sequester the carbon in the soil. So they're an integral part 
of reforestation, an integral part of improving ecosystems. And that's why you see, you know, elk in the deserts. That's why you see deer roaming around. And they're an intimate part of the uh, the biodiversity that we see. And um, and we, uh, you know, we should definitely focus a majority of our caloric intake on uh, nutrient dense animal foods that are easily digestible, especially if you've got gut issues, especially if you've taken a lot of antibiotics and, um, it's, it's just crucial to understand the importance of these animal foods. And definitely. How's my audio? It's not, I've been having some mic issues. You sound good. You sound good. Yeah. And also ungulates are essential to the environment because they break up the soil and they allow seeds to actually find a place to root. There's been, there have been some well-meaning environmentalists who have, you know, blocked off, you know, put up the high fence to keep ungulates out of areas because they believe that they were damaging the soil. And of course, it caused environmental devastation. You know, so it, 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 everything is very, very connected. Ungulates are a beautiful thing. We need those hooves to walk around, break up soil, and poop everywhere. So one thing you mentioned is uh, eggs. And, you know, for people who want to get back into eating a natural human diet, what, what's your take on eggs? Because chickens have been a part of, uh, you, you know, it seems like, like the wolf became domesticated and became a friend of humans it seems like was the chicken ever an, ever a wild animal it just seems like yeah it, this it's is always part of humans thing right yeah i mean these ruminant animals you know cows goats sheep chickens i mean they're just they just almost seem like they're just created just to be our uh you know our little partners and um and they're they're so efficient at creating food for us so uh, yeah, eggs are great food i think uh the egg yolk especially from you know uh you know pastured chickens where they're eating a lot of bugs uh, can have significant amounts of DHA, uh, lots of choline, which is really good for the brain. Um, of course, saturated fat, which is a, an amazing nutrient. It's not something to be feared. Um, eggs are a fantastic source of nutrition. I think they're great. Uh, some people, some people have allergies to the whites of the eggs, and they don't digest them so well. Uh, but for the most part, most people can handle eggs really well. Uh, minimal inputs required to have chickens. If you got, a, if you live in a suburb, you can have backyard chickens and be creating. Uh, generating your own eggs every single day. So we got like ten chickens. We got some chickens right outside the door right now. They're being pretty quiet today, uh, but yeah, we get uh, regular eggs from our chickens here, and uh, it's just a really easy, low input. Feed them a little bit uh, every once in a while. We give them scraps. We give them our meat. We give them our bones from uh, from the meat we eat, and they love it. They are not vegetarians. A lot of eggs will say, "Oh, vegetarian fed." Uh, that's ridiculous. Chickens are not vegetarians. They love meat. They love bugs. And um, if you let them roam around, they'll they'll uh, uh, they'll forage for most of the food that they need if they're given proper space and they're given the right uh, environment. And that's a great way that people can get back into being connected to nature is to have some chickens. If you have room. Well, actually, if you don't have room for chickens, move. You need to live where you can have animals. So go live where you can have chickens. You need to have. You'll probably be happier if you've got space for chickens, no matter where you live. You know, apartment living, I don't think is very. uh, Maybe every once in a while, um, you know, periods of apartment living can be okay. Uh, You know, if you're young, if you're a college student or something, it's almost inevitable. But uh, yeah, I think it's pretty. um, it's, It's a lot. You feel a lot better if you live somewhere where you can have chickens. You can have a little bit of space. Yeah. to uh to move around outside yeah if you can have chickens that is a good start and really i know you know my ideal is if you don't have deer in your backyard in the morning you're living way too close to society to to the city um yeah. i think we're a lot healthier that way and the great thing about chickens is what this is a great peaceful way to be attached to nature to be attached to life to be connected to it because they make the most amazing sounds. And also, yeah. I love chickens because they're just the most ruthless animals. They eat everything. You can throw they anything out rats. there. Yeah, you throw a yeah. dead rat to them, they're going to tear it up. They love it. Yeah, people think that a chicken is... Um, I don't know. There you go. It, it helps. There you go. Everybody, get chickens because it'll help you have a better... If you don't already have them, you'll have a better relationship in nature because chickens are really an education. They're like this feathered you that makes great the coolest sounds and if you are gardening if you are if you do grow stuff you can uh channel your chickens out there and they'll eat all your aphids they'll eat all your bugs snails 
you know, yeah. and if your plants aren't healthy, they'll eat those too. You know, they'll eat seedlings. <laughs> they're they're just devastation. They just they lay waste <laughs> to anything yeah, edible. Keep, uh, if you try to grow vegetables, they'll eat them all. Um, yeah. So yeah, the chickens are great. I mean, they're very easy to keep. Uh, minimal input. All you need is uh, you know a roost, maybe a little coop, and they can sleep in. Protect them from coyotes and uh, possums and stuff. And your dogs, if you got dogs and cats, and um, they'll provide for you eggs almost every day. And uh, depending on where you live, you can have eggs for most of the year if uh, if you live in a you know temperate area. And if you have the right space, um, ducks are great too. Ducks crank yeah, out eggs. Yeah, ducks are cool. I mean, they Duck just crank out great. eggs. Yeah, you need a little bit more water for the ducks, and it, you know they're, they're great eggs, fantastic. And then, how about hunting? Like for me, I don't, I don't think it's in everybody's DNA, but at least for me, it really is. And when it comes to natural meat, it doesn't get any more natural really than going out and hunting it. I mean, do you, I, I would ask like, do you hunt, and do you find that it helps people have a primal edge? <laughs> If they get out there and, you know, it's whether great. it's a rifle or an addle addle, whatever, if they get out there, it connects, for me personally, it connects me to life. Yeah. Yeah, I think hunting's great. I mean, there's not actually a hunting culture in Ecuador. Uh, you know, it's more animal husbandry that uh, that we're into here. And uh, But no, I think hunting is fantastic. It's not something I've uh, grown up with. I had a lot of friends who were into hunting, but uh, never really got too into it. But I think it's a fantastic way to get your food as far as, uh, I mean, look at California where you're not even you're not even allowed to hunt these deer, but they're just, they run around like rats. They're crazy. I mean, they run in the roads and uh, cause car accidents and kill loads of people uh, up in Northern California. And nobody's controlling these deer populations through uh, through hunting. So we are um, definitely disconnected from that, a lot of us. But, uh, you know, not everybody has access to it. It can be kind of expensive to get tags for hunting in certain places of the U.S. So some people see it as kind of, uh, you know, something that's inaccessible to them. But depending on the area you live in, um, you know, if you harvest a couple animals per year, you can feed a family um, with just a few animals uh, very affordably. And, you know, if you've got their freezer space or if you invest in a freezer, you can get all your own meat from um, from hunting. So elk and deer, these um, you know, axis deer in Texas. And there, there are a lot of these animals that are just in abundance uh, out there in the, uh, in the natural world that you can harvest and feed yourself with cheaply. It's a great thing to do. It's also a great. You know, a lot of people to... are against it. They think of you know over oh, yeah. hunting and stuff like that, and you know they they will uh, kind of straw man the trophy hunting stuff. But uh, you know the hunting culture is very very important, and uh, you know there's areas like Hawaii, these hogs that just run wild and they destroy the macadamia farms and stuff like that. They there are animal populations that do need to be hunted, and that if not hunted, they uh, they can actually destroy and ruin ecosystems. Uh, if their populations go too wild. So uh, I'm definitely not for human population control like some of the uh, the degenerate elites are. Uh, but I think, you know, animals do need to be harvested and we are um, – we do it much more ethically, right, than – ethically is a – it's a hard word to use. When you're talking to most people, they – their ethics, their morality, they believe it's just subjective. But they get tricked into thinking that, you know – Killing an animal is somehow terrible. It's somehow uh, cruel and it's awful. But uh, I mean, these deer, if they get eaten by a bear, it is a slow, painful, gruesome, brutal death. Whereas a human being will uh, take out an animal in one shot, give it a quick, painless death, and um, and you know consume it, uh, consume its whole uh, body if uh, done correctly. So I think hunting's a fantastic idea. Yeah, and the deer that was being a deer and living in nature was more alive than most people who think it's wrong to hunt. So it was a vibrant, alive being at one with nature for real, and then suddenly it was not, and that's it. And that's the way it's always been. And when it comes to hunting, I'll ask people, I'll say, well, if you don't like it, were all of our ancestors all through history wrong? You know, like the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a funny thing, right? I, I guess it's a hard argument to make sometimes, though, because you could say, oh, well, you know, I mean, look, our ancestors also engaged in human sacrifice, um, and you know, I think I, you know, 
sometimes sometimes I think that argument is is can be really fallacious to say, well, because our ancestors did something, we should do it. Because I mean, you look at the Maya, the Aztec, and uh, shoot, almost every culture uh, throughout the world uh, was involved in like human sacrifice and all sorts of degenerate stuff that we would probably all agree shouldn't be done. Um, and you know that you know you give the vegans that one. I think uh, that making that argument is difficult for me, but I I, I think it uh, you know hunting is crucial and um, you know it is something that unfortunately we got to eat animals. Unfortunately, all these animals need to die. And um, you know, luckily for them, human beings give them a quick, swift, painless death rather than uh, you know eating them from the butthole up alive like a lion does. Yeah, and it it does help in many ways. Like one of the problems you run into in states like well, it happens in Colorado for sure, is where people get upset when there is mountain lion hunting. You know, like I myself, I'm necessary. Yeah, it's like I myself. I'm not really into any kind of predator hunting and I'm not into like, if it has claws, if it's a cat, whatever. That just doesn't move me personally, but it does move many people and they enjoy it. And the thing about, I've never eaten a mountain lion, but some people really enjoy it. And from what I understand, it's it's very good. So there really are no people who go out and trophy hunt. And the idea is if you ask any hunter, if you could only take the head or the body, what would you take? They'd all take the body. So trophy hunting is kind of a, a farce in the first place by yeah. definition. But when you hunt mountain lions, when you hunt the cats, they stay afraid of people. Just in general, they realize, oh, people are bad news. But when you don't hunt them, that's when it's not just the population that grows – and people will think, well, when you don't hunt them, the population grows, and that's why they attack people. Not really. It's because they're not afraid yeah. of people anymore. You become exactly food. just just like the just like all these highway accidents from deer. They're not afraid of people. They just roam up. They walk right up to their house um, because the, the, you know they're not being hunted. They're not being harvested, and people end up dying because they're hitting them in their cars in the middle of the night on the roads that are foggy in you know Santa Cruz County all the time. So. Um, yeah, it's 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 a real issue, and the mountain lions becoming aggressive, becoming um, you know very brazen in their uh, behavior on humans is is a huge issue. And yeah, I think California is a great example of a state that's terribly managed and that uh, uh, is actually doing a lot of harm through these uh, fake environmentalist programs that end up destructive to the environment. Yeah. And, and it's good. The, the hunting keeps more of a natural balance because, trust me, people, you want bears to be afraid of you or else they'll come and take your deer, your, your, your beef jerky after they... Yeah, your babies. Yeah, they'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll take your baby after, after it rips your head off, you know? So, yeah, take your it's honey, good. Like Yogi Bear. Mm. It's good. Well, as we start winding things up, how has a Primal Edge helped you be more alive uh i guess you could say have greater courage be a bit of a modern day spartan because something that i see you do that i really admire is you interview you take on rather hostile vegans and such like uh durian rider hate to give him any credit and even mention the guy but you know in my opinion i will just say he alleged, gives himself enough credit He'll, yeah he, i would just say I it'll uh, add much. If, if you don't know who he is and you're listening to this i will just allegedly say a real sociopath, you know, um, a person who it's not that I'm afraid of the guy, but it's just that so drastically awful and unpleasant of a human being to have a conversation with him would just seem to be like the last thing I'd want to do. I'd rather like swim up shit Creek, forget the, 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 the canoe and the paddle, you know? So yeah. How has it made you stronger? And I'm amazed at how you take on people with such finesse. You're just relaxed sometimes when you're taking on people that are just kind of awful. I mean, it's, it's sometimes I'll, uh, I'll get a little heated sometimes. And it's like I'm, you know, disconnected and cold. You know, I think, uh, I think it's important to uh, show a certain amount of respect to, uh, to everybody. But, yeah, I mean, some of, these, some of these people online, some of these characters online really do deserve to, to get a good smackdown metaphorically, maybe physically too, I guess. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think diet's a big part of um, of mental health, and I think when our body's functioning well, when we're not so sick and inflamed, we're able to you know perceive what's around us a little bit more clearly because our energy's not being siphoned off into all these inflammatory processes and constantly in a state of fight or flight. 
Um, but yeah, I, th- I think diet in general and just lifestyle, you know, getting outside, natural sunlight, uh, being connected to, uh, you know, the rhythms of light around us, super important for regeneration of the body and the mind. And, um, and when you have a healthy body, then you're able to actually, you know, make bigger decisions on, uh, what you want to do about the big picture stuff. So, um, a lot of what we like to do is take kind of head on a lot of this, uh, you know, this vegan agenda, a lot of these dangerous dietary practices that are being proposed out there by some of these gurus and zealots. And, um, you know, it's, I think a lot of us are just natural warriors. So maybe some of it's just, uh, almost genetic. Some of it's just in our, uh, in our genes to, um, uh, to, to fight degeneracy and to fight this stuff. And I think, um, uh, man, I mean, diet's definitely an important part of health. And, uh, when you're healthy, it does give you more energy, more space to, uh, to make decisions about what you want to do with the energy you got. So I think it's important that we, uh, that we stand up for our cultures. We stand up for, uh, the health of ourselves and of, uh, our families. And something that I'm really into is just, uh, speaking the truth. And, um, you know, sometimes that means you got to confront people. Sometimes it means you got to call people out. Uh, but you know, I try to be nice, try to build bridges. We kind of consider ourselves a vegan rescue operation, uh, especially over the last couple of years, we've been really focusing on, uh, kind of helping some of these people leave the cult and understand the importance of animal foods, of, uh, animal based nutrition and the necessary nature of, um, those animal based proteins and fats. And, uh, these are things we're not going to be getting from plants. So big part of this is spreading the word on the importance of animal foods and helping people to get healthy and take their health back after making perhaps poor decisions to follow some of the poor dietary advice from some dudes like, uh, like Darian Ryder out there who, yeah, I agree is a total psychopath. And, um, um, that the, the internet's kind of this psychopath reward machine these days and sociopaths and psychopaths are rampant on YouTube and, um, uh, people are like using the word sociopath or narcissist nowadays. But I think these are just, um, you know, kind of modern definitions of, um, just evil, right? So that's kind of what we're here to wrestle against is, uh, and that's not the people that are a problem. It's the, uh, it's the degeneracy. It's the, uh, no, we're not battling against people. We're battling against, uh, against evil. You know, it's a wrestle, not against, uh, people, but against powers and principalities and the rulers of the darkness of this world. And, um, that's what we're here to do. I think we're here to do more than just uh, be comfortable and be happy. I think we're here to, um, uh, to to serve a higher purpose and to serve something that's uh, that's bigger than us. So that's kind of what we're about here. No, I completely dig that, what you're saying. Yeah, and it is a fight against evil and it's a fight against degeneracy. And I like that because that's one thing about having a primal edge is you stop being so passive. You know, and I, I do think that just me personally, I do believe that there is right and there's wrong. There is the good and there is evil. And too many people are just kind of, well, whatever, man, it's all good. And I think that we've lost that uh, part of domestication is losing the uh, understanding of that polarity that there is the good. Yeah, people lose their survival instinct. They don't even yeah. fight back yeah. anymore. They just take it. It's just, oh, it's just how it is, man. Yeah, if just somebody. Do your own thing, man. If you're going to go like murder some people, it's like you want to abort nine month old babies and harvest their organs. It's all good, dude. Just give me some more weed. I'll just chill out and smoke bong loads all day, man. Watch TV and Netflix. It's like, all right, well, I, I think we, uh, we've been trained. We've been trained to, uh, so that we can be ultimately, uh, have our energy drained. And, um, we're just you know, copper really tops in the matrix. You know, yeah, right. so really, so, so, so take your energy back. Yeah, because there are a lot of people who are that passive now. They're like, well, somebody wanted to hurt me. I guess that's it's all right. I mean, I wouldn't want to defend myself because then, like, yeah. that would be like the patriarchy. And I, yeah, there's just, there's, or I was like, let's just be positive. I just want to think about happy thoughts. It's like, it's, yeah, it's kind of, these are all traps. I don't think we're here just to, just to focus on what's good and just like, and just be so happy. It's like, we got to, we got to clean up the area. We got to clean up our own home. We got to clean up our own uh, our own soul and uh, and our own mind and clean up our habits. And uh, you know, I think uh, you know once we uh, once we start engaging with that, then we realize that there's a heck of a lot of work to be done. So I think um, you know, uh, good and bad do exist, and we don't decide what's good and bad. It's not just uh, what we feel is good and bad. It's uh, it goes beyond that. 
And I think that's important to recognize. Yeah, definitely. So people get that primal edge back, start working on it. Don't let the mountain lion eat you. Eat it, damn yeah. it, just like our ancestors <laughs> used to, you know? And uh, just don't post pictures on Facebook of, like, eating your mountain lion because it just gives the vegans ammunition. Don't, yeah. So, so you've got something great on your site, the which people can download for free, the Carnivore Shopping List and Resources, which is great. So as we wrap things up, what do you offer? Where can people get a hold of you? You are doing a lot for humanity, and your latest cookbook that is out is a great exploration and education into exactly what we're talking about. Ah, Craig, thanks, man. Yeah, we're uh, we're just happy to be able to share this information and happy to be able to kind of uh, you know fight the battle we're fighting. So um, yeah, you can find more at primaledgehealth.com. We got a lot of resources there. We just came out with our the carnivore cookbook, which is our uh, it's all animal foods. It's, we call it zero carb recipes for people who really love animals. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's available on our website. Uh, we've got a YouTube channel over at uh, Primal Edge Health on YouTube. Find us on Instagram as well. Um, uh, but yeah, we you know we do coaching, we do private consultations as well as a group coaching thing we set up every month, and uh, you know we're just all about helping people to take their health back, to take back um, you know control over their habits, and uh, it'll create a healthy, sustainable lifestyle that they can sustain long term. Not sustainable as in the UN bullshit Agenda 21 crap, but sustainable as in you can maintain it, you can enjoy it, and you can sustain your life, um, you know through certain practices like getting a good diet. Uh, you know, getting outside, getting off the dang computer and, uh, you know, moving our bodies naturally. So uh, that's what we're all about. And uh, we've got a lot of stuff at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. You can find out more over there. Yeah, definitely. I got to encourage everybody to get the cookbook. It is amazing. I know Spore and Hesher over at Alternate Current Radio are digging it and they're having a great time. And we have it. We just got it. And when you buy that, you also get a PDF of it. So you get it right away so that you don't have to wait because who wants to do that? <laughs> and it is a beautifully illustrated, amazing piece of work. And I guarantee you're going to want to go out, run into nature and bite an elk guarantee it so <laughs> yeah well or, or, or maybe just walk into your local butcher your local grass-fed beef cattle rancher and, and get a nice ribeye steak or t-bone um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah we really appreciate the other uh, support craig really appreciate what you're doing and what you guys at alternate current radio are doing and uh you know it's an honor to be featured on your show and um you know anything you need just let me know my friend really uh really excited to see how uh how all this hands out in the years to come and uh, you know wish you and your family the best my friend oh and you too well thanks so much for being on the show right on bye thanks for listening to radiant craters check out more content at radiantcraters.com if you like the show give it a like share this comment keep the conversation going you can also find us at alternatecurrentradio.com where there's this show and a lot more